Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of October 4th, 2021. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.25 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, also on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussions with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, the legislature's Alaska House Coalition effectively admits it is fine inflicting collateral damage on middle-income Alaska families. Second, yes, oil prices are up, but no, Alaska's fiscal situation isn't saved. And third, while we hope Senator Von Imhoff does run for governor. And now, let's join Michael. Uh, let's talk about the weekly top three. The Democrats uh, basically just seem fine and okay with uh, causing a huge amount of collateral damage to the middle class. And in fact, they just don't, they're afraid. They're so afraid that, you know, that the COVID and the thing and the deal and Louise Stutes puts out the letter and give us, give us your thoughts on what's going on here with the special session. Well, we just, we just keep going farther and farther and farther down the, uh, down, down the well, down Alice's well into, uh, Alice in Wonderland's well into another, uh, into another dimension. Um, th- we, I think this all began when Governor Dunleavy said that we need to restore the PFD, uh, admitted for a while, and Senator, Sh- Senator Shower and, uh, and Senator Hughes have admitted that we need revenues to do it, but refused to put any revenues on the table. Kept talking about, you know, bridge financing out of the, uh, out of the uh, ERA instead of putting revenues on the table. And that was an effort. That was a political effort by by the governor, I think, to shift the burden of putting revenues on the table to the Democrats. The the the, the political geniuses, in the governor's office thought, oh, we've got them. We'll uh, we'll we'll say that we need a PFD. We'll, We'll, we'll have this hole in it, and they're the ones who are going to have to come up with taxes. And I'll sit here as the governor. I'll sit here, and I'll just say, uh, no, 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 no taxes, or, or yes, I'll accept these taxes, but not those taxes. And and the the entire political bent was to shift that over to the over to the House majority, uh, mostly Democrats. Well, the Democrats now are are essentially, you know, celebrating the fact they haven't taken it up. Um, the, the sentence that I found so insightful uh, in the letter that Stutes, uh, Speaker Stutes sent to Governor Dunleavy last Friday, uh, the, the top line of which was, you know, cancel the session because we aren't going to do anything. Oh, yeah, and there's COVID. Um, the letter I found so insightful was the first letter of the next to last paragraph. It says the legislature has passed a balanced budget, avoided burdening Alaskans with taxes, and provided an eleven hundred dollar PFD. That was their that's their claim to fame from the last ses- session. We've b- passed a balanced budget, avoided burdening Alaskans with taxes, and provided an eleven hundred dollar PFD. Well, of course. You know, the provided the $1,100 PFD is really we enacted a $2,700 PFD cut. <laughs> uh, it, it, it would it would otherwise be you know $3,800 according to the statute, but they've they've only passed an $1,100 PFD, so they've enacted a $2,700 PFD cut in lieu of taxes. And now they're 
and, and they're celebrating that they, quote, avoided burdening Alaskans with taxes. What's what's getting – so their, their political comeback to the governor is, ah, I'll put you in a trap. I'm going to make you be the ones to, to first talk about taxes. Their response to that was, oh, no, we're not going to do it. <laughs> we're we're going to, quote, avoid burdening Alaskans with taxes. We're just going to take it all out of the PFD. Watch us. Right, right. Uh, back, back to you, Governor. Exactly. Well, you know what? You know what caught my eye in this whole uh, this whole and and I agree with you that that was, you know, especially when they said avoided taxes. And I'm like, well, you took two thirds of the PFD. That's pretty much a tax on everyone. So I don't know what you're crowing about. But what got me was the paragraph before that said throughout the year, we've worked in good faith towards a fiscal plan and that will continue regardless. And I was like, in good faith, you really think that you've worked? for? Okay, I mean. Talk about self-aggrandizement and everything else. I mean, that, that's a totally, you know, we must be living in parallel universes at this point. But but nobody's working. In, I mean, the, the point is nobody's working in good faith. The, the governor says you need a PFD. Even Senator Hughes and Senator, Senator Schauer admits that you need revenues, alternative revenues to to do that, to, to fill the gap. We're not going to cut spending. I mean, we, we went through that in 2019. Even even those senators, the most conservative senators you got among the most conservative senators you got in the Senate, admit that, that you have revenues to do that. The governor's not proposed it though. I mean, the governor's not not put revenues out there, just waiting for the legislature to, you know, to to take the trap. And 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 here's the thing that's just really, you know, really agitating about all that. It's the middle class, it's middle income Alaska families that are being caught in all this. They're the ones, they and the and, and lower income classes, but but the middle income class, all the middle income classes as well, are taking the hit. They are taking more. There's more coming out of their of their income, of their family's income through PFD cuts than would come out through either sales taxes or income taxes. So they're the ones, they're the ones taking the hit. The top 20%. They could care less about all this. I mean, they're they're just they're just happy as happy as 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 clams to watch the governor and the and the and the legislature both run away from uh, both run away from the issue. Uh, it's the middle income Alaska families, uh, the families that are you know earning less than one hundred and twenty five thousand dollars a year, which is basically where the uh, uh, the top twenty percent starts. Uh, it's the middle income Alaska families that are. That are uh, that are taking the hit out of this, and it's just, it, it, and for the Democrats to be celebrating that, for the Democrats to be say, "Hey, guess what? We avoided burdening Alaska taxes with family." Well, what that sentence really is, we avoided burdening the top twenty percent of Alaska families with taxes. We took it by taking it all out of middle and lower income Alaska families. Right. And 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 this 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 um, you know. This lack of good faith, I mean, just to pick up on your point, this lack of good faith is on both sides. I mean, the the the, the governor tried to run a trap on him. They've dodged the trap by saying, not, not us, we're not going to do taxes. We've avoided burdening Alaskans with taxes. And it's 80% of Alaska families that are just taking the hit in the – uh, in this, in, in, in as a result of of both the governor and the legislature running away from their responsibilities, right? And in all fairness, they, I mean, look, the fiscal policy working group did some amazing things when they came together and decided, as a bipartisan body, as a you know bicameral bipartisan body, that there were eight things that needed to be done. There were different plans that were put forward, including taxes, including sales tax, both a Wyoming and a Montana and a South Dakota style tax. You know, some taxes on the oil industry some comprehensive cuts. I mean, there were some really cohesive ideas that were floated around in there, and yet none of the bodies took up those fiscal policy working groups suggestions, didn't bring the, the group in front of the bodies and say, here's a here's what we need to do and here's the plan. They just basically ignored all of that. And it's it's all disin it's all a game at this point. The whole thing is is gamesmanship from the governor's office on down to the leadership of both the House and the Senate at this point. It is. It is. And it's middle income Alaska families, those earning less than 125,000, those with household income of less than 125,000 a year. It's middle and lower income Alaska families that are that are taking the hit of this gamesmanship. They are losing more in revenue, losing more in in household income uh, as a result of PFD cuts than they would if somebody just bucked up and said, "Hey, we're going to do taxes. Too bad we can't cut spending. We're going to do taxes." 
Um, and if somebody bucked up and did that, they would be doing middle income Alaska families a favor. But both the legislature and the governor's office are running right. away with it. And, right. And, and it's just and 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 you don't see any stop to it. I mean, you're right about the point about, you know, the, the working group did great work and put put a, you know, the outline of a plan. And then the next thing, you know, House Ways and Means, you know, the, the body that's charged, the committee that's charged with finding the ways and means to implement it walk away from it and they start talking about a 25 they start talking about jennifer johnston's old 25 and verse Simmons old 25 75 right uh plan so it's i you know well, it's a plague on both plague on both your houses but the, but the legislature can't claim to be any more responsible in this situation than they accuse the governor's uh, uh office of being irresponsible it's both of them that are intentionally dropping the dropping the house on on middle income Alaska families, absolutely. Um, you know, it was uh, it was interesting. Last week we had a we had a caller that asked uh, or a listener that had asked for some definitions because you used the term upper and lower middle income, and and we had folks say, well, what is the you know, when you say that, what do you mean? And you just laid it out and said, you know, anybody making over one hundred and twenty-five thousand is uh, is in the uh, is in the the middle class, and you actually have the the revenue and the distributional impact, and it shows what that is. I just want folks to understand what what we're talking about here. So, for example, my family, uh, six people in my household right now, my wife, myself, and four of my children, we got hit. With this, with this PFD cut for fourteen thousand four hundred dollars worth of taxes, essentially, on our family's income, our overall combined family income, which is more than ten percent of our annual income when it's all said and done. I mean, that's that's insanity to walk around and smirk and say we're not we're not affecting uh, we're not affecting Alaskan uh, families. We're not we're not taxing them at all. That's exactly what happens there, and even even if you're in the upper middle income, that's a that's a that's a definitely an issue. But I mean, this whole thing is just it's insane. It is absolutely crazy that they can pat themselves on the back, say we don't want to go down there because, of course, we could have COVID. And by the way, we worked in good faith already, and we didn't give anybody taxes, and we've done our jobs, and we should just go home. That's it's insanity. It is, and and in part, Michael, it is this. It is this no taxes mantra, which is really a top twenty percent mantra that 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 you know they've that some some other Alaskans have picked up on. You know, no taxes are better. You know, PFD cuts are better than no taxes. Well, yeah, if you're the top twenty percent, if you're if you're if you got a household income of a, of above one hundred twenty five thousand dollars, but the other eighty percent of Alaska families, no, you're not. You are better off. With, uh, with with paying a little bit of taxes, contributing a little bit to the cost of the state, and getting your full PFD. That's I mean that's just how the numbers work out. And but but the top 20% has got you know has got this large chunk of middle income Alaska families bought into this no taxes mantra, and now you got the Democrats who are playing up to that by saying, hey, we passed a balanced budget, and we avoided burdening Alaskans with taxes. I mean th- there is there is nobody. Let's be very clear. There is nobody standing up for middle and lower income Alaska families. Nobody. The legislature's abandoned you. The governor's abandoned you. It's just nobody is standing up for middle and lower income Alaska families. Uh, Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Just to do the math, for those of you who don't have such a large family as I do, let's just see it's mom and dad and 2.1 kids. That's $10,000 out of your income that you lost this year, that you were taxed by taking the dividend. Ten thousand. So every time they t- look at you and say, "Look, we avoided taxes," you know, every time some Republican goes, "Well, we don't want to tax you to then give you the dividend," you're already taxing us ten thousand dollars for the average family of four. Ten thousand dollars. I mean, it just doesn't get any plainer than that that they are already taxing you and that this whole thing is nothing but smoke. And mirrors, and they refuse to talk about anything else. They refuse to talk about a better distributional way. They f- refuse to talk about uh, the potential for some more oil taxes and a balanced approach with oil and sales and cuts and everything else that has been proposed by the fiscal policy working group. Sorry, yep. you know, a flat tax. To, to, I mean, just to put this in just to put this in perspective, ten thousand dollars on a hundred thousand dollar a year income. Um, household income is 10%, right? 
a flat tax, uh, just the same percent for every Alaska family on every source of income, no no uh, 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 screwy you know, exemptions or deductions or nothing like that, just same tax on, on adjusted gross income on every Alaska family, 3%. Three plus a little bit, 3.1, 3.2% is what it would take from every Alaska family uh, to close, uh, to to raise the same thing as that 10% that we were just talking about uh, on a $100,000 Alaska family. And, 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 and that's the numbers. I mean, you, and and I guess, you know, it's, it's the, the, the take level on, on middle, middle, lower, middle, lower income Alaska families is higher than the 10% on the $100,000 uh, Alaska family. You take $10,000 from a 50000 a family with $50,000 of income, that's a 20% uh, tax that you're taking uh, out of their pocket. And again, 3%, a little over 3% would close that uh, on, a, on a flat tax. So, you know, the, the only ones, the only ones that are benefiting from this standoff, the only ones that are benefiting from the no taxes mantra is the top 20%. They're laughing all the way to the bank. Right, absolutely. Uh, Chris asked, does Brad think this special it, does Brad think that the special session is just political posturing for the next election? Um Brad, what do you think about uh you know, the governor's plan? I mean, he basically told us last week he goes he didn't know what was he didn't know what was going to happen. He wasn't going to call another session. This was he was throwing he was lobbing the grenade back into the legislature's court. Is this all just political posturing for the election cycle? As long as both sides say no taxes, as long as both sides, you know, fa- refuse to put revenues, uh, realistic revenues on the table, yes, it's all about polit- political posturing. Uh, the governor's posturing by saying, I can give you a PFD. All I have to do is borrow from future Alaskans, essentially tax future Alaskans through excess ERA draws. The legislature is going to say, hey, we solved the problem. Uh, without burdening Alaskans with uh, with taxes, and they're both just going to stick to that I mean, until somebody puts revenues on the table, uh, realistic revenues on the table. We're just going to continue to sit in this standoff with both sides, you know, pointing the finger finger at each other. You know, it's uh, it's amazing how this uh, this mantra and they've been talking about this taxes versus PFD, um, you know, this talking point for so long. But now we're seeing more and more people pick it up, both on the left and the right. Um, the uh, the the uh, 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 you know the politicians in the legislature have been using it. The the Democrats as well as the Republicans now. It's like the anti PFD crowd has all solidified behind this one argument that well, if you want a full PFD, then you're going to get taxes, and you're just going to tax yourself for the PFD. And so, why would you want to do that? Um, it's uh, I mean, this is crazy. It, 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 it's kind of a crazy mentality, but now people are starting. They've repeated it enough that people are starting to pick it up as a mantra. Yeah, and it's the top twenty percent. I mean, it's it's their it's their get out of jail card. If they can convince enough people of no taxes, uh, just use PFD cuts, then they are, are entirely out of jail. They don't have to contribute uh, anything more than a trivial amount. Non-residents never contribute anything. Uh, uh, the top 20% don't have to contribute any more than a trivial amount. They continue laughing all the way to the bank. And, you know, I've seen it. I've seen it in the, uh, you know, what, whatever that Facebook page is that used to be impeach Walker or recall Walker, the one that's the Alaskans against PFD theft or something like that. You know, I've seen the, the, the top 20% pop in there occasionally whenever, you know, you start talking about realistic solutions and say, no taxes, no taxes. And then they sort of disappear, but they get everybody riled up into the, into the no taxes. We're not going to pay any taxes. Right. Um, and, and, you know, that goes on for like a week. Um, and then, you know, you try to surface the issue again and some tw- top 20 percenters will, will pop in and say no taxes and, and, um, and everybody goes off in that again. It, it's, it's, it's a political science lesson in some ways about how a special interest group can use a mantra to, to get everybody everybody else to work against their own self-interest. I mean, the 80%, the rating 80% of Alaska families, when they go no taxes, they're essentially cutting their own throat. But the top 20% has convinced them uh, that, that's, uh, that that's, that's what they ought to be doing. So, yeah, it's uh, the Democrats have picked up on it. They think it's a, a winning political issue. 
the governor refuses to deal with uh, refuses to propose revenues because he doesn't want to get he doesn't want to go down that road um and um and alaska families with uh, less than 125 percent household income are just paying the price brad keithley alaskans for sustainable budgets um give me a prediction quickly here brad i got about a minute what uh What's going to come out of this? Do you think anything's going to happen? Is there any way? I mean, rolling the chair on the Senate side, does that do anything? Does Is there enough pro-PFD sentiment in the majority and minority on the House side? What Just quickly, give me a give me an idea. Oh, I'll, I'll be shocked if they don't gavel out before before the end of the 30 days. I, I, as long as – the only thing that would change the dynamic is the gov- if, if the governor put revenues on the table. If he if he you know finally came forward with this with this you know mythical sales tax that he's talked about and others have talked about forever, uh, if he finally put revenues on the table, then we could have you know a conversation about this. But as long as he doesn't do that, the House is clearly the House majority is clearly not going to do it, and uh, and and no, nothing's going to come out of it. Uh, Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Uh, we're about to talk about the oil prices. Give me a 30-second synopsis uh, here, uh, uh, Brad. Well, oil prices are topping $80 today. It looks like they're going to – Brent is going to $85. I've started uh, getting uh, uh, IMs and text messages saying, are we going to be saved again? Is Alaska going to be saved again by uh, – you know, bailed out by, by high oil prices? The answer is no. Uh, and and we're going to talk about in the segment why the answer is no, and why those who are going to you know run around saying oh you're going to be saved again uh, are just are you know are just putting us deeper and deeper in the hole uh, each time because we're not going to be facing we're not going to be facing the truth of the matter, which is uh, that we're spending too much. That's just kind of the whole deal here. It's the weekly top three. We finished number one. We're on to number two, which is. Oil prices continue to rise, and people are asking the question: Is this our savior moment? Is this we're going? Is this where we're going to, you know, be saved yet again and dodge the bullet? Brad says no. Brad, give us your reasonings why. I mean, the the numbers are up, but is it is it long term? Is it sustainable? What does it mean for Alaska? Oil prices are up. They're uh, they're approaching eighty five dollars. Um, uh, some speculate that they're going to go to uh, what Harold was speculating, ninety-five dollars. Goldman speculates a hundred dollars. Uh, LNG prices uh, in Europe right now are above two hundred dollars uh, equivalent uh, oil price. Um, if you measure, if you if you converted the LNG prices to oil prices, are above two hundred dollars. Uh, what's going on is that uh, while we were in COVID and even before we went into COVID. There's been a lack of fundamental investment in developing uh, new oil supplies. The oil's still there. Uh, the oil is uh, is there in the in the Permian, for example, the tight shale oil that uh, that we've talked about endlessly on the show and elsewhere uh, is there. It didn't go anyplace. It didn't disappear uh, during COVID. But there hasn't been investment uh, to bring it forward. A lot of things are going on. Some want to blame the uh, the the Biden administration. That ha- that does have a, a role in it. Uh, but the biggest share, Scott Sheffield, who's the CEO of Pioneer Natural Resources, the biggest shale player uh, in the Permian uh, and one of the biggest shale players uh, uh, nationwide, uh, did an interview in Financial Times uh, this week. And Sheffield said what's really going on is our investors, our shareholders, are telling us they don't want us to invest. They want they want us to take the free cash flow that we're getting out of, you know, producing the oil that we have developed, um, and and give it to them in terms of, in terms of dividends or in terms of stock buybacks, but but benefiting the shareholders. They don't want us to reinvest, and that any any shale company, publicly traded shale company, that does reinvest, that does uh, put that money back into the ground right now, is going to be punished. Uh, by Wall Street, by you know, people are going to drive its stock price down because they're going to transfer over to to other companies, uh, invest their, their money in other companies that are that are spinning out that cash, uh, uh, spinning out the cash flow. And basically, Wall Street, what Wall Street is saying to a degree is, we want to be paid back for all the investment we've made in it, but also we're concerned about given where it, where the environmental issues are going. Uh, and climate change issues are going. We're invest. We're concerned about investing more uh, in what might become a stranded resource. So we're at this point in time 
where we've had underinvestment uh, during COVID, during and before COVID, where Wall Street is 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 resisting uh, reinvesting uh, uh, cash, where demand is returned. Uh, uh, coming out of COVID, uh, oil demand has returned coming out of COVID, um, and prices, you know, you've got a lower supply, you've got a higher demand, uh, prices are responding. The question is, is that is that condition going to persist? And and the best source to go to 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 try and figure that out is the futures market and 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 see where people who have money who are putting money on where oil prices are going, what uh, what their conclusions are. And if you look at the futures market, we are at a high point. Um, the oil prices start going down from here. By uh, FY25, Alaska FY25, uh, which is the end of 24 and the beginning of, uh, of calendar year 25, oil prices, the futures market is saying oil prices is $63. Uh, FY27, $59. FY29, $59. So the futures market is saying, look, this is this is a temporary situation uh, that uh, that's not going to be not going to be persistent. We're going to go back to essentially pre-COVID pricing uh, once uh, this all balances out. And the futures market essentially is saying, at some point, uh, Wall Street is going to relent, see the opportunity to uh, to, to cash in on. Uh, current production, they're going to they're going to have fewer fears on uh, on stranded uh, stranded assets. Release that money, allow uh, oil companies to go back to drilling with the money as opposed to pumping it out in dividends or share buybacks. That will bring additional oil on. That oil will 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 bring the price back down to to pre-COVID levels. So for anybody to say anybody in Alaska right now to be saying. Oh, we've been saved again. Oil prices are high. They're going to stay high. We're going to we're going to work our way through. We're going to we're going to we're out of this. One, even even at current oil prices, we still aren't uh, balancing the budget uh, uh, through uh, traditional revenues. But two, uh, the futures market is telling us emphatically that oil prices uh, aren't going to stay at this level uh, for uh, for any uh, substantial period of time. So. Yeah, I, my response to when people say, "Are we, are we saved again? Do we have one more chance to to get this right?" The answer is no. <laughs> we're we're in a temporary blip. What we will look back on in in two or three years as a temporary blip of high oil prices. Um, we ought to enjoy it, uh, pay down debt, uh, not incur any more debt, not in, incur any more debt, uh, any more draws from the CBR or or excess draws from ERA. While, uh, while, while, we're, while we're in this period, but you can't count on it. It is irresponsible to count on it uh, continuing over over even the midterm, much less the longer term. All right. <clears throat> well, well, I'm sure there's some detractors already, but uh, we can discuss that here at a future time. we got one more thing to talk about here. we got about three minutes, and that is number three, and that is the uh, rumor that, uh, and of course we've heard this rumor before, but... Uh, uh, Jeff Landfield, even over at the Alaska Landmine, said lots of chatter about Senator Natasha von Imhoff jumping into the governor's race. Gonna get loose, is what he says. And you say, bring it on. Let her jump into the race. What, what do you say? <laughs> I so much want Natasha to enter the governor's race. We, the, y You can do a lot better uh, with an issue if you can personalize an issue. If you can, if you can attach it to a person and focus that issue on a person, uh, Natasha is the perfect person, given her greedy and entitled speech, which which I would be played over and over and over and over. If she ran again, but given her greedy and entitled speech, she would be the perfect person to 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 personify the top twenty percent, the greed of the top twenty percent, the 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 you know don't make us pay for it, shove it off on middle and lower income Alaska families aspect of the top 20 percent i think it would be great if she ran for governor and then we could personalize the issue the top 20 percent issue to her and say do you want to elect a woman who is going to who has who, blatantly looked out for the top 20 percent is going to continue to look out for the top 20 percent or do you want to do something else that looks out for the remaining 80 percent uh, of alaska families i so want her uh to jump jump into the race and help focus personalize the issue going forward all i can see is ad after ad the greed and entitlement 
you know, immediately breaking to entitlement, Senator, you receive an entitlement every month from your trust fund and blah, 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 blah. Or the I'm so sick of these clothes and everybody else is out there barbecuing and Senator, you got, I mean, I could just, I could design a campaign that would just destroy her in that regard. I mean, it would be amazing. And, and I heard this is a rumor and the Senator Bachicki has denied it now to my, to my, you know, directly to me. But I mean, there was, there was a rumor that she was going to partner with him. And then there was this, I mean, who knows what's going to go on. It's all rumor and innuendo, but if she did jump into this race, man, could you imagine what a poop parade that would be one minute? Yeah, she, she will spend a lot of money on it, um, and you know th- she'll throw a lot of money at it, and and maybe that has some influence. We saw that in the in the oil tax uh, election, but but I, it's just it will finally personify this issue, and we can and to me it will help s it will help get this debate resolved once or once once and for all. Do you want the top twenty percent to win, or do you want the remaining eighty percent of Alaska families to win? It's is it's on it's on the ballot, folks. You decide. And and I and, and I think it would finally get us to some answer. You know, I'm uh, at this point. I'm almost mandated to play the uh, to play the Natasha clip. The greed, the greed, and the entitlement, the entitlement. is astounding, astounding to me. Astounding. I just don't fathom it. She just doesn't fathom it, Brad. She just doesn't fathom it. <laughs> yeah, you know, and the sad thing, Michael, is she believes that statement. She, oh yeah. She, oh yeah. She totally, she totally believes. I mean, the, she believes that it's the remaining 80% of Alaska families that are greedy and entitled because they want their share of, of the PFD. They want their share of, of Alaska's wealth that uh, the governor Hammond uh, established for them. They, she believes that they're greedy and the remaining 80% are greedy and entitled and that, and that, and that, and that they're, you know, they're, they're engaged in class warfare if they try to get her to uh, to uh, contribute in in any sort of uh, equal manner uh, with uh, with the, the what she's calling for the remaining eighty percent of Alaska families to uh, to, uh, the, to 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 contribute through PFD cuts. Well, I mean, I, it would just it would be it would, it would I, the debate the de- if you know I'm not sure Governor Dunleavy's up to it. Um, but the debate of, of, you know, with her of, you know, claiming that it's greedy and entitled to ask for a PFD cut and versus somebody who's saying, uh, Senator, you want to talk about greedy and entitled, that debate would just be classic. Oh, yeah. No, absolutely. It would be <clears throat> it would be astonishing to use her words. It would be. A, but you do make a valid point. I mean, she's got she's got money personally. She's got all of her donor class, which is the top. Well, I mean, really, we're talking top 5%, not even top 20%. Um, but, I mean, th- th- there's a lot of money. And this with between the jungle primary and the ranked choice voting, um, you know, be careful what you wish for, right, Brad? I mean, at this point, I mean, she could be, she could overwhelm the whole race with, uh, um, you know, she could overwhelm the whole race with money. And then what would happen? Would people buy it? I don't know. Yeah, it's um, – it, it's – uh, but but at least we would finally have it out. At least we would finally have this this issue out, right? I mean, it'd be it, it'd be an odd race. You got Walker in there, who was the original, you know, uh, uh, t- tatter uh, of the of the PFD. You got Les Guerra, who actually in this context comes off as fairly reasonable. <laughs> Uh, and then you got Dunleavy. So it's it would be an odd race. Uh, uh, but I just having her out there finally being able to personify the, the what the top in her case, the top one percent is trying to do to the rest of Alaska families uh, uh, to force them to pay the bills as opposed to her family uh, contribute contributing a, a, a share uh, of the cost of government that she keeps enacting, that she keeps voting for. Um, you know, it's not, it's not only that she doesn't want to pay, she keeps voting for the budgets that, that require everybody else to pay. So that she doesn't want to even contribute her share of what she's voting for. Uh, it'd be, it'd be a, it'd be a great race. Got to have somebody on the other side who can run a strong race against her. Got to have somebody who can, you know, step up and make that point, uh, in a, in a, in a strong fashion. But, um, but I think it'd be a great way of personifying personifying this issue uh, uh, for the electorate. 
Um, <clears throat> Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. I, uh, um, I mean, I'm just, I'm just shocked at this point to think that she, you know, and and that's really, you know, what what are we what are we faced with? If that was a four way race between Dunleavy, Von Imhoff, Guerra, and Walker, oh, I mean, you know. I mean, I know who I'd really kind of have to vote for, although it's kind of a hold your nose kind of vote. That's the worst part is that there's really I mean, there's no it, there's no good options. It is like the least worst option out there would be the one you'd have to pick. And it would basically take us right to where we are today. We would it would be remaining the same at this point. Everything else would be worse remaining this versus remaining the same. Yeah, there's room for for more candidates uh, in this race. There's there's room for candidates who can strongly articulate articulate the middle income uh, uh, position, strongly articulate what's in the best interest of the overall Alaska economy and the best interest of of, of Alaska families uh, as a whole. Certainly, 80% of Alaska families. There's room for another candidate, um, and there's time uh, for another candidate to to get in the race. So you you can hope. That uh, that if Natasha got in, someone who are, who's able to articulate these issues uh, would get in uh, get in as well on the on the other side. But you know, just the opportunity to personify what the what the top one percent, top five percent, top twenty percent is up to uh, in this state. The the greed that that they have uh, of wanting to push this burden off on middle and lower income Alaska families. I, it's just too good to pass up. So Natasha, if you're listening, listening. Please run. Please, please, please run. <laughs> All right. Less than a minute here, Brad. What should we be watching for on the special session in your mind as you're as you're watching this yourself? There's really no nothing to be uh, nothing to be watching for until uh, either Governor Dunleavy or somebody in the in the House Majority Coalition puts a puts a real uh, uh, revenue package uh, on the table, replacement revenue package on the table. At that point, we start paying attention. But until somebody does that. We're just, you know, it, there's not really any reason to get up in the morning and, and you know, go go to your go check your paper for the first thing to see what's going on, because not much is going to be going on. And is your prediction you think that they'll gavel out this week or or what do you think? They'll gavel. I, I don't want to go this week, but they'll gavel out. I, my prediction is they'll gavel out before the before the end of the 30 days. It'll just run out of steam. Nobody will know what to do. Uh, there won't be any activity. Nobody's going to be in Juno. It's just like, you know, why are we doing this? Right. Well, it'll be interesting to watch Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you, my friend. Appreciate you coming on board and joining us today. Michael, as always, thanks for having me on the show. All right. Appreciate it. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages. And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Topic.